welcome to episode 64 of Lucretius Today. I'm your host, Cassius, and together with my panelists from the EpicureanFriends.com forum, we'll walk you through the six books of Lucretius's poem and discuss how Epicurean philosophy can apply to you today. We encourage you to study Epicurus for yourself, and we suggest the best place to start is the book Epicurus and His Philosophy by Canadian professor Norman DeWitt. For anyone who's not familiar with our podcast, please check back to episode one for a discussion of our goals and our ground rules. If you have any question about those, please be sure to contact us at epicureanfriends.com for more information. In this episode 64, we'll begin our discussion of book five. Now let's join Martin reading today's text. Who can, with all his soul inspired, compose fit numbers Verses the majesty of so great things of these discoveries. Or who, in words alone, can sing his praise and equally deserts? Who, from the labor of his mind, has left such benefits and bestowed rewards so glorious on mankind? No mortal man alive, as I conceive, for could I raise my verse to reach the dignity of things he knew? He was a god, my noble Memmius, a god he was, who first found out that rule of life which is now called true wisdom. And who, this human life, so tossed with storms and so overwhelmed in darkness, has been rendered by his art so calm and placed in so clear a light. Compare the benefits long since found out by those who now are gods. Sarah, they say, discovered first the use of horn, and Bacchus gave to me the knowledge of the wine and its sweet juice. Yet men might still have lived without both these, as many nations as we are told do now. But no true life could be without the mind easy and free, and therefore with better right is he to us a God, whose gentle rules received throughout the world bestowed on main tranquility and peace. If you should think the great exploits of Hercules exceeded this, you are carried far from truth. For how could the wide, gaping jaws of the Nemean lion or the terrible Arcadian boar afraid us now? How could the bull of Crete or Hydra the plug of Lerna, encompassed his, his poisonous snakes, or uh, Gerion with his triple face and the collected strength of his three bodies. Or what can we now suffer from Diomedes' horses, from their nostrils breathing fire, dreadful to its race, the Bistonian plains, and all about Mount Ismarus? Of what from the Arcadian birds of Stympolus, feared for their crooked lieutenants? Or that huge dragon, fierce and terrible in look, that Twining round the tree, guarded the gold food of the Hesperides. How could he hurt us here, removed far from us near the Atlantic shore and the rough seas, where neither Roman nor barbarian dared to visit? And other monsters, which that hero slew, had they not been subdued, how could they hurt us now, now or were they alive? Not in the least, I think, for now the world abounds with frightful beasts that fill with dreadful terror the forests, the high mountains and thick woods. Yet these places commonly is in our power to avoid. But endless the mind be purged, what wars we sin, what dangers wretched mortals must endure, what piercing cares or fierce desire must tear the minds of men. And then, what anxious fears, what ruin flows from pride, from villainy, from petulance, what from luxury and sloth. The man, therefore, that has subdued these monsters and drove them from the mind by precept, not by force, should not this man be worthy to be numbered with the gods? especially since of these immortal deities he has spoken nobly and at large, and by his writings has explained to us the laws of universal nature. His steps I follow, and now pursue his rules, and by my verse I teach that things must needs subsist by the same laws by which they were first formed. Nor can they break through the strong bonds that nature has fixed to their being. Of this sort the soul, in the first place, I have proved to be originally derived from mortal seeds, nor can it remain eternally undissolved. And that images commonly deceive the mind in our dreams. When we fancy, we see a person that has been long since dead. Okay, thank you, Martin, for reading that. In today's episode, it will just be Martin and myself and Charles. Elaine's not with us this week. Hopefully, she'll be back very soon. But we will begin the discussion of book five uh, with just the three of us today and see what we can do with it. The opening section, the opening paragraph is very memorable for how it compares Epicurus to being a god. And I think people talk about that a lot in the context of the ending to the letter to Minoseus. He says that we can be like a god among men. And of course, there's so much discussion of what it means to be an Epicurean god. There's a lot of uncertainty here as to whether this should be taken literally 
figuratively or some combination of the two. So what do we think about that? Who wants to start, Charles or Mark? Definitely not in a cold lake perspective. Yeah. I, I know that, get, that gets tossed around a bit. But elaborate on that. When you say not cult-like, you mean he's not being literally compared to a supernatural god? Or one of the subtleties we have to sort of think about is the Epicurean definition of a god seems to be so different from what we're used to today in terms of the supernatural. Is he talking here and comparing Epicurus to a god? Is he comparing him to a supernatural god or to a non-supernatural Epicurean god or what? What do you think there? I, I think the text is, you know, a non-supernatural Epicurean god, but uh, just the issue of, like, in a, in a cult-like manner, I would say it's um, the trend of hero worship in the philosophy. I think that some people might be confused and would take it that the text here, or even us as a community, or just Epicureans in general, would be following Epicurus and comparing him to, say, some sort of ascended individual akin to a supernatural or omnipotent god, rather than just praising his achievements as a philosopher. Martin, what do you think? Yeah, I'm, I'm still trying to, 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 to get through the, all the pros. Hmm. Very mythological. Yeah. Well, you know, on this first passage we're talking about, I sometimes sometimes I do think that there's a tinge of humor in some of the uh, Epicurean texts. And, you know, like even today we can talk about if I try to use a specific example, I'll embarrass myself, but just some particularly good basketball player or some particularly good football player. He's a god of football players. I don't know that there's not some aspect of, of that kind of colloquial usage as well here. He's just whenever somebody so exceeds in his profession that he just seems to supersede everybody else in terms of his talent or ability. He's often, I think, even today referred to as almost godlike in his capacities within that field. It is very tongue-in-cheek, I'd have to agree. And there really are interesting subtleties here, too, about where he says he first found out that rule of life, which is now called true wisdom, almost as if he's implying that the Epicureans refer to their own philosophy as true wisdom. And also that he says that had rendered by his art so calm and placed in so clear a light. It it seems to me to be talking about the clarity of what Epicurus had said in addition to its wisdom. So I think those are significant. And then the comparison to Carries and to Bacchus about how he's worthy of considered being a god because of the benefit that he bestowed on mankind because of his philosophy. That's kind of not exactly tongue in cheek, but it's, it's certainly more an illusion or figurative rather than actually saying he's literally a god. It seems as a comparison compare the benefits long since found out by those who are now gods. He might have said who are now considered to be gods. And of course, during this particular time as well, at some point, I guess this was before Julius Caesar, but were the Romans already considering their leaders to be, they were not, I guess, at this point, but it wasn't very long before they started considering themselves to be deified, right? Mm Mm-hmm. I don't know whether the Greeks had that kind of a conception among their leadership or not. God kings are very early. I don't know what the word is. It's it's a very early idea, though. Yeah, maybe it would depend upon what part of Greece you're talking about. I don't really have the impression that the Athenians considered their, like Pericles, to be a god. But maybe some other parts of of Greece did. I don't know. I I don't expect that. You would not expect that? I, I, I can't think of any. Greece is very politically diverse, not just Athens. But so how about Alexander the Great? Because he was Macedonian as opposed to Greece. Did Was Alexander considered to be a god? I don't think so. He often compared himself to, was it Apollo? I'm not sure. But at least in this period when Lucretius was writing, I would expect that it was something that was recognized that uh, men might be considered to be gods without necessarily being i don't don't know if that you know when when julius caesar was supposedly deified does that mean he's he became supernatural in some way at that point i i don't really know what they thought yeah but i don't think this is an indication that the epicureans considered epicurus to be immortal or in any way uh supernatural because of his achievements 
Charles, are you familiar with all the different illusions in the feats of Hercules that are mentioned in paragraph two? Yeah, it's just been a while since I've read them. The Go ahead. Plague of Lerna, for example. I don't know what that is referring to, but I know that Lerna, it's a, it's a region in Greece. I want to say it's around Corinth, but I might be wrong about that. Uh, but it was known for, like, its waters and its springs. So is the plague a, a monster of some kind that is encompassed with poisonous snakes? The word plague, of course, would evoke a disease right now. But Or, or is the plague of Lerna a synonym for the hydra? I'm sorry, maybe when you read it all together, he's talking about the hydra and calling the hydra the plague of Lerna. Because the hydra was encompassed with poisonous snakes, right? Mm-hmm. Because of the or, like hydra, comma... And then the continuing title, The Plague of Lerna. Yeah, that's where it might be useful to compare Monroe and and Bailey, but I think you're right. The triple-breasted might of threefold Garion. Is Garion some kind of a dragon? Yeah, Uh, Garion was, I believe, a plant. A plant? Mm Mm-hmm. Oh. Very plant-like animal. Oh, but it was an animal, too. Okay. Mm Mm-hmm. Let me look it up real quick. Oh, he was a giant. My bad. I'm thinking of something else then. Yeah, he was a giant with uh, three heads, but some sources uh, said he had three bodies. I guess it's probably significant in some way that his argument seems to be that even if these type monsters were still alive, we have the ability to avoid them by not going near them. That seems to be his conclusion as to how to deal with them without needing a Hercules to kill them. So I guess maybe... Maybe the analogy might be that he's talking about Epicurus teaching us how to avoid the true hazards of life. I thought about it more as like fearing myths and Yeah, that you don't have to fear them. Right, right. Is he calling these superstitions here or is he just saying it wouldn't matter if they were alive? I guess it's the same thing. It's very easy to read this in a in a literal sense. Mm-hmm. Um but the, the text, uh, at least here in the Brown translation, that says, where neither Roman nor Barian dared to visit, I, I see that as just, you know, the, the philosophy and the, the line of thinking and the, the mindset, you know, that it's different, that it's, you know, it's something else entirely that would speak to Epicurus's greatness. Mm-hmm. For even now the world abounds with frightful beasts, and yet these places commonly tis in our power to avoid. Not only places and monsters, but literally philosophies or religions that are threatening and, and yet wrong. Mm-hmm. And keep in mind, he is addressing this section to Memmius, yeah. so he'd be well he'd be you know, well acquainted and familiar with these myths. Before we go to the next passage, Martin, any comment on those Hercules references? Yeah, it, it's more on 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 the series at Con. So I think we discussed this briefly some time ago already. Because it, it puzzles me that all three translate this word as corn. So, so what do you understand under corn? Say that again. What do what? Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I quote that uh, phrase. Now, theorists, they say, discovered first the use of corn. So, oh, yeah, we, we have talked about that before. Yeah, I always think about cereal when I see that reference. Uh, yeah, I, I think cereal. it was like millet or something. And you know, when you were reading, when Martin, you were reading that, I was, I thought to myself, oh my gosh, I've got the wrong section here because I think he says the same thing basically in the next book, in the opening of it, he talks about corn and coming from Athens or something like that. So that apparently was a big allusion to them to be talking about how important corn was. Yeah, but, but, uh, yeah, that, but that would refer to grains, huh? So, so yeah. Like, yeah. Like I think that. we talked about that in, I think, book one. <laughs> yeah, yes. And the funny thing is, I mean, because this may, may come back, so I want to settle it once and for all, because I remember very clearly at my first international conference, when I was uh, after the meetings in a private discussion with some of the established uh, researchers, then I, uh, I, I used the, the word corn mountains to refer to what actually were grain mountains. And an American researcher of German descent corrected me that should be called grain mountains. Huh? So, so that's why I would say in this context, it would be more clear to to, or the, to, to, to say grains and not, not corn. Because corn is uh, uh, typically, actually means more specifically maize, doesn't it? For us in the United States, it means maize, yes. Mm-hmm. So you're right. You're, say, you're saying that they're, they're mixing wheat versus corn in these references. A European thing, yeah. 
This is a British translation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, all three of them are. And yeah, the, all Monroe, three. Yeah, Carrie's, Monroe says corn, and Bailey also says corn. But you're saying that what we really are talking about is wheat. That's a good point. I, barley would be under it, too. And be, be, because uh, it, with respect to the garden, they refer more to barley than wheat. Okay, so I'm going to betray my memory failing me. Where does corn come from? Is it natural to a particular continent, or is America's, that what was brought? It's, is it's, that, a new, it's a new world crop. Yes, maize okay. is from, from America. It, it didn't exist in ancient times in Europe. Okay, okay. So that's why you're saying it has to be wheat or barley. It cannot be maize. Exactly, exactly. I got gotcha. you. They grow it in Europe now? Uh, yes, of course. It's, it's used a lot for, for to... Uh, to feed uh, animals, but also for human consumption. I, I, even in Thailand, they grow it because it can stand the heat and dryness. No? Because we have a pronounced dry season, and uh, the maize quite likes it. All right. Anything further on Hercules or those allusions to classical mythology before we move to the next passage? Well, I mean, just to to tell it clearly, you know? so so of course it was a, a great feat that. Uh, these more or less uh, legendary deeds of Hercules and others uh, killed these, but th- that's were just uh, of, of uh, yeah, then local importance for, for those few people who lived in these areas. For the vast majority of people, these monsters never posed any danger because they would just not be there. No? Exactly. You're doing the obvious, which I should have done at the beginning, is to, is to make the obvious point of the paragraph. No matter how heroic those deeds of Hercules might be, they pale in significance to the accomplishment of a true philosophy like uh, Epicurus developed. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And that's the segue to the next passage, because that's what the next passage is about. But unless the breast is cleared, what battles and dangers must then find their way into us despite? What pride, filthy lust, and wantonness, what disasters, luxury, and sloth. He, therefore, who shall have subdued all these and banished them from the mind by words, not arms, shall he not have a just title to be ranked among the gods? What comes to my mind there is you you do struggle, as Charles referred to earlier on, whether this is cult-like or not. There, there's a hero worship involved to some extent. The status of Epicurus within Epicurean philosophy gets discussed a lot and whether he's held in too high a regard. And there's something improper about whether he enforced his beliefs on his followers and whether people were just told to do what he said and not think for themselves and so forth. But I think this helps put it in proper perspective that when somebody does something for you that is so incredibly beneficial for you, you feel naturally and correctly a lot of gratitude for it. And I, I think that that's where he's generally going with this opening section in book five is that it is appropriate to hold Epicurus in high regard for his achievements in philosophy, since the philosophy is so important to us in helping us live successfully. And so when he compares them, this is not the one where he talks about him as a father figure, but he's really saying that Epicurus exceeds a father figure. I know in a lot of cases in reality, fathers don't live up to the uh, standards that you'd like to think they would live up to. And so I guess this is a carrying the illusion further from the prior book where he compared Epicurus to a father figure. He's saying that his contributions and what we owe him is greater than a father. Not sure where to go off that. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. He's, I guess I'm still looking at the words he's using. He's talking about the disasters they occasion. And then continuing on to say, uh, and luxury and all sorts of sloth, as if luxury and sloth are also disasters. This The list of things includes their pride, lust, and wantonness, along with luxury and sloth. And all the more so that he was wont to deliver many precepts in beautiful and godlike phrase about the immortal gods themselves and to open up by his teachings all the nature of things. I don't guess he's generally thought of as maybe the most godlike writer, but maybe it's okay to say that. Well, and then the final paragraph that we have for today is a transition paragraph from this opening. And when we go next week, it'll be more detail about where he's going to talk about. But in this final passage we have for today, walking in his footsteps, I follow out his reasonings about certain things. 
there's probably something interesting to talk about there by what law all things are made and what necessity there is then for them to continue in that law and how impotent they are to annul the binding statutes of time. One thing that brings to mind is that people tend to consider the swerve to be one of the most significant parts of Epicurean philosophy. But I always remind myself, and I think this is a statement of that, that while the swerve is important, there also is necessity and continuity brought about by the properties of the atoms. The swerve does exist, but so does continuity and the laws that arise from the nature of the atoms. What do you think about that? Martin, we've kind of discussed that kind of thing before, the balance of necessity versus contingency that comes about from the swerve. Or agency. Or, yeah, agency. Yeah, I mean, it's really that you need to swerve only for agency and nothing else, essentially. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you, you only have the billiards model of Democritus. Well, or, or maybe to be more clear, it, it should not be only agency in a wider concept to to uh, prevent determinism, so 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 to, so to avoid determinism, so so that would be rather more appropriate to say the main function of the swerve. Yeah, sometimes I get confused on this particular point. Are there two functions? Is it is it to avoid determinism, and did it also play into? The, is that how universes or worlds are formed? Is when a swerve starts the atoms colliding within each other? Because isn't there a discussion in book two about how if the swerve did not exist, all the atoms would just fall down in a straight line, and that the swerve is what broke the tendency of all the atoms just to fall straight down? I, I believe it says that in, in that opening of book two under the where the swerve is discussed. I, be, I believe so, that when he talks about like the blows of them. So when people talk about what functions does the swerve serve, I think there are two categories, the determinism aspect and also the formation of worlds. But the reason I brought it up as significant is that I think some people have a tendency to overstate the, the significance of the swerve. People will say, oh, the swerve is a forecast of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And as a result of that, anything can happen anytime or something like that. They take it way too far. But the truth is, is that both exist at the same time and that Epicurus is clear, not only here, but also in the letter to Herodotus, that in general, things do follow a mechanistic pattern. Otherwise, we would not have any continuity. Otherwise, the whole philosophy would be worthless because all the different arguments we've made about what we've seen in the past, giving us information about what to expect, would be worthless because all these arguments about the same fruits coming from the same trees and types of animals giving birth to similar types of animals, all mm -hmm. of those things would be useless if, in fact, the swerve was so dominant that nothing was predictable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all that stuff in book two about trees not being comprised of little bits of fire and lava mm -hmm. right or trees not sprouting up from everywhere instantly yeah and I, i'm sure no doubt that i'm being overly broad in the way i'm describing this but i do think there's an important principle here that there is both necessity in some areas and there's also agency in some areas within epicurean philosophy and it's important to study where the division lies and why why it exists like that but he's clearly saying here that it is important for you to realize that in terms of the determinist part of things, you're going to have to recognize that some things don't change. And foremost in that class of things is that the nature of the mind was formed of a body that had a birth and will be unable to endure unscathed through time. And so the two things he's citing here as being significant to consider in the context of determinism is that you only have one life to live. You're not going to be living after you're dead. And then, uh, interestingly, the second one is his explanation of the images and how they cause you to see things when you're dreaming or specifically how the images cause you to see images of people who are dead when you're dreaming. That's what he specifically says. And next week, he goes off in more discussion of the details. So I guess as I'm looking at how he ends up this passage here, it probably is very significant to see that he's stressing the importance of you only have one life to live. You're not going to be alive after you die. And then the working of images when you're asleep. It's interesting to me that he includes that one when he says foremost in which class. I don't think I would have expected him to include that necessarily. 
But that's probably because we don't maybe appreciate the full extent of what the images theory was meant to address. But if that's a reference to religion and to the makings of how you see things when you're dreaming and you see things when you're hallucinating that leads you to come to the belief that there is life after death or that there is supernatural religion, maybe that is a reference to the first two of the principal doctrines about no supernatural gods and no life after death. Well, maybe it's good that we had a shorter section since we don't have Elaine with us today. We can put together some final thoughts here and then bring this episode to a close. Uh, Martin, you have anything yeah. in general would, to summarize? I would elaborate a bit with a small tension on that things must need to subsist by the same laws by which they were first formed. This is basically the founding stand, statement of geology, geology as a science. So it was, uh, I just looked this up because I forgot the name. So it is James Hutton, the 18th century geologist, who basically founded geology with, with a statement like this. So that uh, the, the same processes which have uh, formed the earth, the surface of the earth in the past, are, are going on, uh, are, are still going on. So, and this one was a, uh, was basically the leading idea along which geology could be developed as a science. Hmm. That's interesting. I did not consider that. Which which passage were you referring to again? That things must need subsist by the same laws by which they were first formed. So it's almost like this. It's not exactly like this because this refers specifically to the, uh, to first, uh, by which they were first formed. But it's more like it's, it's the continuity of the, the laws of nature. No? And in geology, this was something not easy to see because the geological process, which have a significant impact, are typically extremely slow. So a single human over his lifetime will not observe much no? on, on this one. So, so that means it was not an easy idea to come up with. That's very interesting. I did not consider that. And it took me a second to, I realized now that I had uh, flipped down to the Monroe version and I was not seeing the version you were reading from, from 1743. But yeah, again, the 1743, I think is particularly well written and clear there. Nor can they break through the strong bonds that nature has fixed to their being. And since I read the Monroe version a minute ago, I'm thinking through it as I read it again. But the, the 1743 on the, the two things that it singles out to emphasize says, of this sort, the soul in the first place, I have proved to be originally derived from mortal seeds, nor can it remain eternally undissolved. So clearly that's the reference to the importance of one life to live. And then and that images commonly deceive the mind in our dreams when we fancy a, we see a person that has been long since dead. The way that's written causes me almost to think more in terms of he's referencing how important it is to have a canon of truth so that you can analyze things that you think you see. And I guess there's a reference to seeing a person who's long since dead as an example of it. But really, you're using the canon of truth that he's formulated to analyze basically all the images that you come into contact with. All right, Charles, have any closing thoughts for today? Not really, no. Maybe later on in book five. Just as a prelude, he says he's going to talk about the forces that pilot the course of the sun and the wanderings of the moon. And then he's going to talk also about the gods living a life without care a little bit, or just, or at least he's going to reference that those are the forces that allow the gods to live without care and how we tend to be brought back into religious scruples and take upon ourselves hard taskmasters. So in general, he is going back into the physics but it's another more general, as I'm scanning through for next week, it's kind of a high level of physics. It's not getting into atoms and void. It's kind of like he's talking about the conclusions that come from the physics as opposed to the details of atoms and void. So it should be, I mean, we're in book five. We ought to be at a level where he's expecting the reader to be taking what he's talked about before and, and drawing some conclusions. So it should be interesting. But we can deal with that next week. So... Martin, you got any other thoughts? No, Goodbye. I'm done. Okay. I'm done. Okay, well, I think we've done what we can with this text for today. We'll come back next week and continue with book five. So thanks, everybody, and see you soon. Yeah, thank you. Okay, bye. bye.